Good morning, everybody. My name is Remco Munich from Asphalion. I'm the Regulatory Information Director. Um, welcome to today's webinar from Asphalion and Dora Wurst uh, languages. Um, today we have the pleasure to talk to you about the centralized procedure, translation management. Um, as it is exactly 10 o'clock, we would like to start. Um, first, we will give you a short outline from Asphalion who we are. Then we will explain you something about the centralized procedure. Um, including the translation management and at the end um, then we will pass through our partner Dora Wurst languages which will explain you about um, their services how you can support how they can support you with translation management with regards to questions um, there's a panel in, in in the screen where you can um, raise your questions and the questions will be answered at the end so we will read them out um, so if you have any questions during the, the session feel free to um, write them as we have a full program and a lot of slides, we would like to start. Um, so, first about Asphalion. Next slide. So, we are a regulatory, uh, scient scientific and regulatory consultancy services. Uh, we were raised, um, founded in the year 2000. So, uh, in the meantime, uh, a long period of um, helping companies and registering uh, medicinal products. We have offices in Barcelona, so I'm based in Barcelona. That's our main headquarters, but we also have offices in Madrid, Munich, and Amsterdam. With regards to Amsterdam, we opened this in 2019. Um, the offices are on walking distance from IMA. So if you ever ever um, the idea to have a meeting with IMA with an expert from Asphalion, feel free to contact us, whether it's for a scientific advice, pre-submission meeting, a pediatric investigation plan, or the final submission of translations, let us know. Uh, we would be delighted to, to assist you. What are our services? Um, we help companies either for drugs, biologics, advanced therapy, medicinal products and medical devices. And we really help companies from early development. So um, by the time that there's a, a concept, a product under development, we can help with um, defining the roadmap. What do you need to do? We can write the entire dossier, the entire CTD compilation. We do global submission. Uh, today we focus on the centralized procedure, but we also help companies supporting registrations in, in uh, US, uh, Canada, Switzerland, uh, other regions. We also do electronic submission, uh, so ECTD needs to be mandatory in a lot of regions. We do life cycle, the whole variations, and last but not least, we do pharmacovigilance to keep the product safe on the market. So with regards to the support for centralized procedures, here I put a slide on what are, are really um, our um, services for pre-registration activities. We help companies with investigational medicinal product dossiers, IMPDs, um, scientific advice meetings, pediatric investigation plans, orphan drug designation. Um, for the project management of the start of the procedure, we can also help with the eligibility request, um, which I will explain in a few slides what it is. Um, we can help you with the product name and the procedural request. We can do the complete CTD preparation, including the administrative preparation, the summaries and overviews of module two, the CMC part of module three, and the non-clinical and clinical parts, uh, module two and module four and five. At the end of the finalization, we can help with the translation management. That's why we are here today. Um, and last but not least, also the transparency policy, which I will explain also in today's presentation. So with regards to the centralized procedure, um, a little bit about the background of the centralized procedure. And we need to explain a little bit the history of uh, registration procedures in Europe. So before 1995, there was no other way to register products in Europe by doing national registration. So if you wanted to have a registration in 10 countries, you had to do 10 national registrations. However, in 1995, two different EU procedures were introduced. Um, one is the centralized procedure. And in the centralized procedure, you get one marketing authorization, which is valid for whole Europe. So you get one marketing organization, one marketing organization number, one MA holder, one product name that's valid for the whole Europe. Another procedure that was introduced was the MRP, the mutual recognition procedure, that in case you had a national registration, um, you could mutual, mutual recognize this product by a number of chosen countries. Later in 2006, the DCP was also introduced. Um, this basically works like the MRP, um, but you do not have to have first a national registration phase. You can, US applicant, US MA holder can decide immediately to which country uh, you want to submit your dossier. 
Today we focus mainly in the CP, just the difference. I mean, the centralized procedure is really one single market organization for entire Europe. And the marketing organization, as soon as you grant it, it's valid for all countries in the EU. A national registration, it's only one marketing organization per member state. So here you see a map of the Netherlands, where I'm originally from. Um, so you can have a national registration either by a national procedure or a mutual recognition or decentralized procedure. So that's, that are EU procedures in multiple countries, but you still get a national registration per member state. Why would you choose the um, centralized procedure? Well, in some cases you do not have a choice. It's obligatory to, to register your products by centralized procedure. Any product, any medicinal product developed by means of biotechnological processes, you need to register it through uh, the centralized procedure. Also new medicinal products, uh, new active substances used for the treatments of AIDS, cancer, neurodegenerative disorders, diabetes, autoimmune and viral diseases. You do not have a choice. You need to register it through the central, central procedure. Orphan drugs, also obligatory. So whether your product is one of these um, classifications or it could even be a biotech for curing cancer and it's an orphan drug, it could be uh, no, all the three different scopes, but it's obligatory to register through the centralized procedure. In, additional, it's, uh, in addition, it's optional for new active substance not yet authorized. So also if you have a new active substance that is not treating one of the above indications or it's not a biotech process and it's not a, um, an orphan drug for the indication, you could still, it's optional, you can choose, you can decide if you want to register it through the centralized procedures. Then it's also optional for medicinal products with significant therapeutic, scientific, technical innovation. So if you would not have a new substance, but um, you still would like to use the um, centralized procedure, you have to justify the fact that you have a significant therapeutic, scientific or technical innovation. Um, it's optional if the authorization is in the interest of patients at community level. So again, you would have to justify. And last but not least, um, the centralized procedure is also optional for generic products for centrally authorized medicinal products. So if the original product was not registered through the centralized procedure, a generic cannot be registered by the centralized procedure. But if the originator product was registered through the centralized procedure, then the generic has the option either to register also through the centralized procedure or go to national MRP or DCP directly. Okay. So what happens in the centralized procedure? You submit your application to the European Medicine Agency, the EMA, which is currently lo uh, located in Amsterdam. It was many years in London, but they moved. Um, then the assessment is being done by a rapporteur and co-rapporteur. These are not um, people that are working for the EMA. These are really from the national competent authorities. So these are the assessors, uh, the technical, they check your dossier, they um, make the assessment report. The assessment report contains questions uh, you need to answer. In the end, if everything goes okay, the marketing organization is granted by the European Commission. So it's not EMA that approves uh, registrations. It's this, um, there's a, a board, CHMP, that uh, gives a recommendation for approval. And then it's the European Commission that in the end grants a marketing organization. If you get the marketing organization, it's one marketing organization that's valid for the entire Europe. So the next day after receiving it, you could market your product directly in all the countries. Um, I mean, you do not have to wait on national uh, registrations, except for non-EU countries like Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein. These are not European Union countries. The, uh, these are European economic area countries and you need to be rectified in their national uh, territories. So it's one marketing organization in Europe, so one product name, one marketing organization holder, and it also means you cannot sell if you want to sell in one uh, country to another company. This is not something that you can do in a centralized procedure. You are the MA holder with one product name and it all has to be on your name. There are some requirements um, for the submission. If you want to register in Europe, of course, you need to have a marketing organization holder that's located in EU. What is important also is to check the small uh, medium enterprise status. If you are a small medium enterprise, uh, a lot of our clients are SMEs and you are eligible for discounts in fees, uh, also help with the translations and the translations will then be helped during the marketing authorization application uh, in order to get your product registered, not with post authorization procedures. 
but also important you need to have batch release site inside the European economic area so if you have um, in the in the end the batch release site has to be uh, within yeah, Europe the manufacturing side you also need to have an EU GMP license so if you have a manufacturing site outside of Europe you need to make sure that they have been audited inspected you need to have an European qualified person for pharmacovigilance um, you also need to have a pharmacovigilance system master file located in Europe so if you are a company outside Europe 4.4 4 and 5 you really need to make sure that these are covered if you do not have this we can also support you with this and last but not least it's important to, to really state the legal basis of the marketing organization what is the type of product uh, do you have an orphan drug do you have an advanced therapy medicinal product do you have a generic do you have a biosimilar do you have a biotech product do you have combination with the medical device etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's really imp important what kind of legal uh, basis you have um, below what I put there be aware of the Brexit of course um, if you're now a company located in your in UK uh, or you have your EU QPPV located in UK after if the Brexit ever happens um, that would really affect points no the points one two three four and five that I mentioned here that if you now have your EU QPPV located in UK um, as soon as the Brexit occurs UK would be treated as a country outside of the European Union and uh, that would uh, impact your 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 situation so if you have any question with regards to this feel free to contact us later we can always uh, assist you with regards to the legal basis for the marketing organizations there are some differences um, I, I will not go into too much details but basically if you are an originator dossier you no know, uh, you would have a full application based on the article 83 of the directive uh, a generic application you make reference to the originated dossier you're in article 10 1 there are hybrids uh, there are similar biological biosimilars um, that are uh, registered through the through the centralized procedure um, which are different uh, legal basis so here we just listed them um, it's important to take into consideration you no know, depending on the legal basis you also need to comply with your do dossier and then we can also support you with compilation of the dossier with regards to the centralized procedures in november 2015 there were 859 uh, in september 2016 there were 924 and in april uh, last year uh, two years ago it was 1026 uh, last year what ima did is um you see there below 84 positive opinions 42 new active substances five negative opinions so five were also not accepted 10 applications were withdrawn during the centralized procedures and then you see uh, further down below you see a further breakdown it's uh, three advanced therapy medicinal products so these are ATMPs <clears throat> 21 orphan medicine orphan medicines so these are med medicines for an orphan indication four accelerated assessments one conditional marketing authorization and three approvals under exceptional circumstances which I will explain a little bit more in detail so in total now there are around a little bit more than 1000 registrations um, through the centralized procedure here um, this is a slide from the information that we got from IMA um, here you also see the number of new products per year started and finalized the um, number of well-established used abridged hybrid the number of generic applications you know so generic um it's, it's around 50 percent of the applications um also the biosimilars where there's a huge increase since a couple of years and, and on a yearly basis around 15 uh, are being started or finalized or for medicinal products there you see a number around 20 that are being uh, started finished and in 2019 it was a busy uh, first three months where they already have received 11 new uh, orphan medicinal products and advanced therapy you see the total numbers are not so high of course um, but there are more and more advanced therapy medicinal products and we have been heavily involved in the registration of uh, ATMPs uh, here the same information but um, in um, a graph on how many new uh, medicinal products for non-orphan um, orphan medicinals uh, similar biologicals so these are the, the biosimilars and the generics hybrids 
So 2016 was a busy year, 2017, 2018 was quite the same, and 2019 started quite uh, with some activities. <clears throat> so what's important um, for before starting a centralized procedure, of course, you need to have a dossier, you need to start writing that, but um, you need to, the first step that you, if you really want to go through the centralized procedure is you need to do a submission of an eligibility request. So if your product is to cure a certain indication, no, if it fits in the mandatory scope, um, the eligibility request is a formality. However, if it's um, one of the optional use, you need to justify why you would like to have the centralized procedure and you really need to get the approval. Um, normally this has to be done between 18 months, so one and a half years or seven months before the submission of a marketing organization application. Then seven months before the submission of your application, you need to have a notification of intention to submit. So after you receive the eligibility request or the, the eligibility approval, um, you then have to have a confirmation that you really want to submit. So this has to be done seven months uh, before. Then you also get the appointment of the rapporteurs. So at the CHMP meeting and, um, and the PRAC, the Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee um, appoints the rapporteur and co-rapporteur. Normally these, um, I mean, you cannot really influence this, but you can um, informally, of course, um, ask member states to support your applications. Normally you are, you are already in contact with some agency uh, due to scientific advice, meetings, clinical trial applications. So normally you have already some, some contacts there. Then last but not least, you have the pre-submission meeting and the pre-submission meetings are the best opportunities for applicants to obtain procedural and regulatory advice. So it's uh, six to seven months before the submission. It's the last moment that you can talk and align your dossier if you have any question about, ah, um, I have this data or um, what should I do in this case? So that would be your uh, final point. What should be the done? The submission format must be done in ECTD. So this is mandatory since 2010. So also, if you do not have ECDD publishing, uh, we do this for a lot of companies. The submission has to be done by the EMA gateway, and this is illustrated below. What happens with the EMA gateway? Um, you submit to the agency. So you log in into the website. It's a se secure gateway server. Um, it's through the internet. It connects to the EMA. They receive the dossier. They send a notification back that you receive it. And also the validation is done automatically. So EMA validates um, the technical validation, not, not the content validation, but the technical validation, if the ECTD is valid, will be done inside the system. And then uh, EMA shares it on the repository. So as soon as it's on the common repository, then the national competence authorities can take it from there. There's no need to su submit anything else to the national competence authorities. So the timetable for the centralized procedure, the submission should be done um, 14 days before um, the procedure starts. So that's day minus 14. Then there's the validation period where we, um, where the uh, EMA will check if your dossier is complete, if there's uh, anything missing, any information. As soon as the validation is okay, then uh, the day zero starts according to a fixed time schedule. So EMA has published on their website all the times uh, that you can submit, all the times that the procedure can start. So as soon as the, um, the procedure starts, it's day zero of the procedure. And then the first assessment will be done. The first assessment will be done until day 120. Then we have a clock stop. And the clock stop um, means that you receive a list of questions. You need to answer this list of questions. As soon as you have responded to your list of questions, the, the clock restarts again. And then the second um, assessment starts where you get the final opinion on day 210. Um, the final opinion is a CHMP um, decision where you can have information. You no, know, you will get the confirmation if your product is acceptable, yes or no. And then, last but not least, you have 66, uh, 67 days to arrange your translations. So here we will go into more details. Just very quickly um, to highlight. There are also some EMAS incentives um, to register your products. So depending on the type of product, depending if you're an advanced therapy, if you are breakthrough uh, therapy, you know, if you are uh, orphan drug, if you are really curing, um, let's say an un unmet 
medical need so you're curing a, a disease which is no i mean people are dying from it and you can really get quicker approval then there are different ways in 2004 accelerated assessment was introduced in 2006 conditional approval uh, we have adaptive pathways we have prime uh, un unfortunately we do not have enough time to go in all these different um, projects processes that we can support you with but depending on your product um, these are really can be uh, investigated we have experience with all of them so if you have any specific product feel free to contact us um, now can we use adaptive pathways can we use accelerated assessment can we use conditional approval yes we, we can check that at the end of the centralized procedure what can happen okay one thing can happen is that there's positive opinion so we get uh, we go into the translation and transparency which i will go into more detail or there can be a negative opinion um, a negative opinion you can appeal so 15 days uh, are there to appeal um, luckily in our all our experience that we have we always got the positive opinion um, but you can have 15 days to appeal 60 days to submit the grounds for appeal um, and the CHMP will then have 60 days to consider revision of the initial opinion. Of course, you cannot submit any new data. Um, you can you can consult scientific advisory groups. So here we have an example um, somewhere in 2016, Takeda overturns a negative EU CHMP opinion um, in a face-to-face -face appeal. Uh, so it is possible. I mean, uh, as mentioned, we only have experience with positive opinions with all our cases. So that's good. Then what happens? Um, translations. So between day 210 and day 267, you need to submit your um, translations. One of our recommendations would, of course, be don't wait till the last moment. Um, with the start of the translations, already during your application, you know um, if you uh, will get a well, you don't know 100% sure, but you you are you have some indications if you will get a positive opinion, yes or no. If the if it looks like you get a positive opinion, um, our um, recommendation is really to start the translations before. Um, depending on what kind of product you have, no, I mean, you might be a biosimilar, then you can compare with the originator. Um, even if you have um, a new originator product, you might be referring to other texts of, of existing originators that you can use. Um, of course, that would save time and money. Uh, what we can do is then we can compare the text, we can um, prepare this, then the translation cost is it's already reduced. Um, if you really have an originated product with a new indication, with everything new, new product, uh, then you would have to have translations from scratch, and also there we can support you with. Um, so here's uh, some kind of process on how we can support you. Then um, transparency policy, also to highlight um, the EMA policy, uh, it's called 0070. It's for transparency uh, of clinical data for medicinal products. So the objective was to avoid duplication of clinical trials, to share information. Um, it was effective uh, since January 2015. Um, so it was applicable to all centralized procedures uh, submitted after 1st January. 2015. Uh, what is the ID? The ID is that EMA is going to share information about your modules 2.5, your clinical overview, your module 2.7, the clinical summary, and your module 5, the CSRs and appendices, uh, your protocol and protocol amendments, um, the sample case report forms, and the statistical methods. What you can do, you can redact certain confidential uh, confidential information, so either uh, company confidential information or uh, patient information, you can remove that, uh, you can redact it, so you have to submit a redacted proposal that EMA will review, and you have to submit a final redaction if they are agreeing with your with your proposal or, or not. So in October 2016, the first publications were announced by EMA. However, in November 2018, um, the EMA has suspended the publication of the clinical data um, through the policy 0070 because uh, due to the Brexit continuity plan. However, in future, uh, this will be, uh, no, once EMA has been settled in, in Amsterdam um, office, which should be later this year, 
they are expected to restart uh, this activity. So again, if you need support for the reduction of your uh, clinical data, let us know. We have done this for a number of um, procedures. It's quite time consuming, but uh, then we can uh, help you with that. What's also important, um, after completion of their initial marketing authorization, of course, you need, you as an MA holder, you need to continuously uh, monitor the safety of the products. You need to report adverse events uh, of patients to the National Combat Authorities and EMA. Um, as soon as the marketing authorization is granted, you also need to submit information to the Article 57 database. This is a database at EMA, which is called XEVMPD, Extended Other Vigilance Medicinal Product Dictionary. It's a product with all the SMPCs um, with structured data that you need to submit to EMA. If a product is not marketed, you run the risk that it uh, will cease to sunset clause. And within five years after registration, uh, a renewal has to be submitted. What's also important is that any change to the registration, if you want to change anything, a product name, additional pack size, change the specification, shelf life, manufacturing, manufacturing process, a new indication, whatever, that will be a variation. Also for maintenance activities, no, again, we need we can support with the translations. So either it's an update from the originator or other updates, we can uh, organize the management of the translations, align with the affiliates and then uh, submit them to the agencies. So for translations, um, within Asphalion, we are working with an ISO validated process. Um, so we are ISO certified, it means also that our partner selections, we need to be um, according to a process. So we always audit and validate our partners by, by the quality department. We um, have experience with working with, this, with these partners and we can recommend them. Uh, with regards to the translations, we have wide experience. We know we have a large experience with the management of translations for the centralized procedures and for translations specifically, we work with Dora Worst Languages, uh, where now I will pass the word to Eleni, uh, from who's the senior project manager at Dora Worst Languages and will guide you more through the translation process. Eleni, you hear me? Yes, hello. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Remco. I think I need to share my screen now. Yes, please. Um, so Doraworth Languages is a UK-based translation company that was founded in 1962 by Doraworth. We specialize in translations in the life science sector, and we are proud to offer a friendly, flexible, high quality and specialized service with in-house um, medical expertise. Uh, we are ISO certified and our procedures are tailored specifically to the life science industry. Um, we operate from our London office, um, but we have a global network of translators and medical experts that are based in the country of their target language. Uh, we're corporate members of the UK Institute of Translation and Interpreting and members of the uh, Clinical and Contract Research Association, the CCRA, and the Biopartnership Programme. Um, our client base uh, consists of, uh, but not only, uh, pharmaceutical companies, regulatory consultants, medical device companies, CROs, uh, university clinical trial units, clinical research consultants, medical publishers, and um, as I said, we specialize mainly in the um, uh, translation within the life science industry. Um, a large proportion of the work we do is within the regulatory affairs that we will cover um, today. Um, we will mostly speak today about the centralized procedures, uh, but we also provide translations for human and veterinary medicinal products, for other procedures and decentralized mutual recognition and referral procedures. We cover the translations um, for new application, as well as variation of existing products. Uh, we translate from scratch, uh, we um, look after the translation of uh, any updates that come after the rapporteur and the CHMP opinion, and following the submission uh, of the translations, we also handle the member states' comments and we liaise directly with the national competent authorities. And at the end, we provide um, the full package, including the QRD Form 2, uh, as well as bookmarked PDFs. Um, we also 
provide uh, the translations that are required uh, for application outside of the um, uh, European Union and into the target market uh, language. Another large proportion of um, work we do is in clinical research. We translate documents um, targeted to healthcare professionals as well as uh, patients, making sure that we adopt the right style and register so we ensure uh, patient compliance and accurate results um, in clinical trials. Uh, here is a sample of documents within the clinical research area that we translate, um, clinical study protocols and synopses, um, ICFs, investigators' brochures, and um, uh, ethics committee letters, and uh, other documents within this area. We make sure that uh, the study title as well as terminology are consistent across documents that refer to the same study by using uh, same translation team and translation tools, uh, the computer-assisted translation tools, CAT tools, uh, that serve this purpose. Here is an overview of um, other areas that we cover. I'm not going to go into details for all of them. Um, I'm listing here a few of the files, um, sample files that we translate within medical devices, um, medical research and publishing. We make sure when a, a scientific paper goes for publication that we take the extra steps to ensure the register um, is and the style is appropriate for a publication, uh, pharmacovigilance, manufacturing documents like SOPs, batch manufacturing records, etc. Legal translations within the medical industry. Uh, our translators need to combine um, legal and medical knowledge to be able to translate documents like clinical trial agreements, uh, insurance policies, etc. And then training material um, like. Um, uh, presentations for internal use for training purposes, manuals, and etc. Um, so after this uh, brief introduction, uh, let's just now focus on our subject for today, which is the translation of product information uh, in a centralized procedure, where the requirements are to translate the English PI into 24 languages following the EMA QRD templates as well as the guidelines from the EMA uh, like uh, EDQM terminology, MEDRA terms, layout, uh, formatting, excipients guidelines and so on and so forth. It's a list of them. Um, here we have um, an illustration of the centralized procedure. Uh, most of you and Remco also mentioned um, the the path, the, the dates. Most of you are familiar with the stages and the actual dates of a centralized procedure where um, the English document is assessed by the EMA and the relevant committees all the way through to the um, submission of the translations uh, following the positive CHMP opinion and following the submission, uh, the assessment by the national competent authorities and the submission of the final package on day 235. Um, in the blue um, comment boxes, you can see how DWL works in parallel and in close cooperation with you to create the 24 uh, translations. Um, now what I'm going to do is split this procedure in stages and present it to you from the translation point of view. And I will speak to you about the tasks um, that DWL undertakes at each stage. So the first stage is what we call the pre-translation stage and the work that is required to prepare an English file that will be the base and the foundation on which the translations will be created. Um, at the start of the procedure, uh, DWL will discuss with you your timelines. Um, it is very important that the procedure dates as well as the first draft are communicated to DWL as soon as they are available. Um, companies, they tend to get stressed a bit about um, getting it right with the English and making the deadlines and um, they don't always allow enough time for the translations, which are equally important. And then we end up um, rushing and when we could have just done, we could have just started much earlier and have had enough time to complete all the necessary work. 
and and why is that um an average product information file has between 8 to 12000 words and that's how we we work in translation with words um which would normally take about 3 to 4 weeks to translate into 24 languages including all um our quality checks um however it really depends on the content for translation and the quality of the English file. Some PIs require more research than others due to their technicality, or for example, if it is a new product for a rare disease, this, there is not much uh, literature available out there in all languages, and the translators need additional time for their research, which means that it will take longer to translate. Uh, DWL will assess the English draft file and will advise on the time required for the translations and the necessary quality checks so you know to allow um, enough time uh, for the translations. Uh, from the day 120, around 120, 121, uh, when you will have the second version of your English file, uh, which will be closer to how the um, the English will look at, at will look like um, at the end. Um, DWL offers to work with you on the preparation of the English file and identify any passage that might be ambiguous when translating. We're not here to review the English file. We understand that um, this is approved text by the EMA and the relevant committees, and we're not here to rewrite it. What we do is identify passages that can be problematic when translating, discuss them with you and seek clarification or get approval if uh, we need to change. Um, we need to understand that um, every language is a different system with its own structure and any ambiguity in the English might end up being misinterpreted and mistranslated if it's not clarified. English is, is a more flexible language, but other languages are more strict and there's not much room for ambiguities. So we need to get the English right uh, from the beginning. Other things we look for uh, when we check the English is compliance of the English file with the QRD template and layout guidelines. Now you're most probably um, wondering uh, why you need our help to prepare the English file, especially if your file has been prepared by a native English expert. Um, and as I explained, every language is different. They have different rules, different structure, and a different cultural background that we need to take into consideration when translating. Um, here I've got some examples uh, to make it a bit clearer uh, what I am explaining. Um, the first example is, uh, comes from um, all examples are real and they've taken from real uh, files and, and package leaflets mostly. Um, first example, uh, take this medicine with cottage cheese. Now, this is an example that uses a culture country specific product that might not be known in, by patients or lay people in other countries. Many times there are instructions um, on how a medicine should be taken and food that you should take or avoid when you take a medicine. Cottage cheese is very popular in the UK. However, it is not well known in other countries or might not even be available. If you ask my Greek mother, she's an excellent Greek cook, but cottage cheese, um, she would look at you with a big question mark on her face. Um, in cases like this, we will have to localize the product and find the respective product in the target market. But this is not an advertisement on a television. This is a package leaflet and it's instructions on how to take a medicine, which is very, very specific and it has to be very clear um, to avoid the worst. Um, therefore, we would advise our clients to avoid using country-specific products and opt for something more common, more global, let's say, something like yogurt in this case, or something that has the same um, effect. Um, 
the next um, example comes from pediatric uh, package leaflet for pediatric use for a medicine. Um, do not take this medicine if your child is um, allergic. Now, the instructions in a pediatric uh, package leaflet need to be addressed to the parent that will be giving the medicine. The parent won't be taking the medicine himself or herself, they will be giving. So the correct way to say it is do not give this medicine to your child if your child is allergic. The English language, again, is, is more flexible. They might even allow for this inconsistency of the subject on this occasion, although it still sounds odd in English. But other languages that have more strict structure might not permit uh, this inconsistency. And the most important reason why a review by DWL should be considered is because any ambiguity or mistranslation might put the patient's safety at risk. And here are um, a couple of examples as well. Um, the first one is the word uh, drug, which in English it has two minutes, meanings. It can be medicinal drug, it can be illegal recreational drug. So which one? is meant in, in the product information. Uh, it has to be very clear and very specific so the translations are correct. And the last example uh, under this point, um, a higher incidence of grade three to four anemia, dyspnea, tachycardia and fatigue. Um, again, English language, it's an English structure this language but if you try to interpret it and put it in another system of different rules you can you will have to um put the reference where it belongs to and here it is not clear if grade three to four refers to anemia only or all of the adverse reactions it's not clear um that's the kind of things that DWL will um, come back to you with and ask for clarifications. Um, during our check, we um, also check for QRD template and layout compliance, simply because a fully QRD compliant English source file will ensure that all 24 languages are fully compliant. The translators will use QRD template wording only where the English file does. Otherwise, this might lead to mistranslation of the source. Um, and last example, um, again, in the method of administration section in the package leaflet, how this medicine is given, if it is an injection or if it is a um, solution for infusion, um, the medicine is given by a healthcare professional. But on this case, the template doesn't have this option. It only reads how to take this medicine. If the translators on this occasion follow the template and not the English source, then the very important information that the medicine is given and not taken, as you would with a tablet, is lost. And this can also impact on patient safety, as the patient might think that they can simply inject themselves. Um, which you don't want them to do. Um, so these are the type of, of um, things that DWL will flag up to you uh, when you prepare the English file and before we start uh, translation. Um, at DWL, uh, we believe that um, if you get it right at the beginning with the English file, you will create uh, 24 very good translate translations that um, will save you time and money, not just now for this procedure, but throughout the life cycle uh, of the product information as you won't have to fix incorrect translations. The second stage from the translation point of view is the actual translation process. The ideal scenario is that we start translation around um, day 150. Um, I think Remco also mentioned the earlier, the better, um, especially if it's a, a new product, if it's a cutting edge medicine, uh, or if there are more than one pharmaceutical forms, which will mean that we have to create 
uh, more than one SPC and package leaflet. And this is something we will advise upon site of the draft file at the beginning of the procedure. Uh, this stage covers the entire translation process from the trans translation of the first draft to the updates that will emerge from questions and responses you will have with the EMA and uh, the CHMP opinion until the final submission on day 215. The translation of a product information file requires an advanced set of skills and knowledge combined in the people who are involved in the translation process, which also includes your affiliates and the member states. Um, our translators have the linguistic competence in both source and target language, as well as the medical and scientific um, knowledge to translate these very technical documents. However, they are also able to adapt their style depending on the target audience, healthcare professionals for the SPC, patients, lay people for the package leaflets. Knowledge of the standard regulatory text is also a must, and all our translators have experience in the regulatory processes. Uh, technical abilities like IT skills, uh, translation tools, or other word processing skills, they're a necessary aspect, especially when we deal with fiddly and very heavy tracking in variations or in um, updates. Uh, DWL has the necessary procedures in place to select resources that combine all these competencies, and all DWL project managers are specially trained on the EMA procedures and requirements in order to be able to handle EMA projects of that size and complexity. So as I mentioned before, the ideal start day uh, for the translation is around day 150, uh, when DWL works with you to understand the requirements of the project and make sure that they are communicated uh, to the translators, who will then produce the translations of the PI in 24 languages. Uh, we will also send you a project requirement form, so we try to get as much information as possible from you that will be useful uh, for the translators. Um, in uh, at DWL, we provide a three-step translation, uh, which is translation by a qualified medical translator, revision by a second qualified medical translator, as well as um, all our quality checks, uh, which includes completeness of translation and compliance with all the requirements uh, from the EMA. Um, we understand that um, some of you have local representatives in the target markets that speak the target language and also have the knowledge to review the translations. DWL uh, works very closely with your affiliates to take on board their feedback and finalize the translations. Um, around day 180, 181, it's very likely that you will be receiving updates to the draft file uh, following discussions with the EMA and the relevant um, committees. Uh, DWL updates the translations with these changes and making sure that the newly added text is consistent with existing translation and terminology and that all uh, strengths and presentations, if you have two SPCs, two package leaflets, that they are updated consistently and where and if necessary. Um, again, um, if the new text needs to be reviewed by your affiliates, DWL continues to cooperate with them for the best outcome. Um, unfortunately, updates don't come all in one go. It can be that we receive several updates, even on the same day or day after day, or whenever you receive um, responses or feedback uh, from the relevant committees. This uh, creates parallel versions, which is very easy to lose track of. DWL is there to take care of your version control, so no information is lost. And that is um, one of the biggest challenges during this stage, as the translation process might be a different stage for each language when we receive 
um, the updates. For example, we might have the Italian being with uh, the translator and the Spanish being revised and the Dutch uh, being uh, with uh, the QC checker. So all these people have to be informed that there is a new version and there are more updates. Um, another challenge when having several parallel versions is that the same sentence or paragraph is updated differently in each version. For example, EMA suggests a change, uh, but with the next draft, this change is reverted back to what it was before. Therefore, all changes made need to be tracked against the latest received version of the English file to avoid missing out changes. Um, it can also happen that changes are not tracked and we risk again missing out on them. Um, it is very important to be on top of your version control to avoid any problems with the translations. So any problems with your version control will impact the translations. DWL makes sure that no changes are missed out by closely analyzing the latest version and liaises with you to agree on the final updates for the translations. So it is very important to keep in mind that any change in the brief or problem in the English PI will have to be communicated to 24 translators, 24 revisers, all the QC checkers were working on the project and your affiliates. This sums up more than 50, 60 people and um, it is very easy that the message is lost if it's not clear. So they have to be crystal clear to avoid miscommunication, misinterpretation. The last part of this stage, but definitely not the one with um, the least importance, on the contrary, this might be the most challenging part of it, is the so-called five-day window that starts with the receipt of the CHMP opinion and any changes that might come with it, as well as any additional um, annexes like um, Annex A or Annex 2 for new products. DWL works within the tight timeline of the five-day window to provide the final translations ready for submission on day 215. If required, we adjust our turnaround times to um, allow time for your affiliates to review the translations before your submission. Um, at the end of the five-day window, DWL provides quality translations compliant with QRD requirements, applicable METRO terminology, EDQM terms for successful and on-time submission on day 215. Um, so the biggest challenge during this uh, part of the process um, are the very tight timelines within which uh, we are asked to uh, provide the translation and perform all our quality checks. Um, we say a five-day window, uh, but is it really a five-day window, especially for the translation? Um, the opinion is received mostly around uh, midday on Friday, as opposed to Thursday, where the actual CHMP deadline is. And it can be that the marketing authorization holder um, may require the translations on Monday in order to complete their um, internal checks. So basically, we're asked to uh, provide our translations with all the quality checks within a, a weekend. And it, can, it has also happened that we receive the opinion on a Monday and we are asked to um, complete the word either on the same day or for the following day. So DWL makes sure that um, all the necessary resources are lined up to handle the CHMP opinion changes and um, annexes over the CHMP weekends. So, um, just put that. here is something else uh, to take with you today please send the CHMP opinion as soon as it is available so we have the maximum time possible to perform um, our QC checks and uh, complete the work.
um, the last part of the procedure is um, the post-linguistic review. Uh, during this stage, we receive the comments from the national competent authorities. We assess them and we liaise with um, the member states to resolve any disagreements. And we also prepare the final package for submission, which includes um, clean and annotated files, bookmark PDFs, and that are created uh, based on the EMA uh, requirements. In a bit more details, um, at post-linguistic review stage, DWL will assess the comments from the member states. Um, we always do our best to go along with uh, their suggestions, but at the same time, we need to make sure that no errors or deviations from the source and the reference EMA documents um, have been introduced. If any disagreements arise um, at DWL, we have the experience to liaise directly with the uh, member states to resolve them and always in agreement with your affiliates where and if necessary. Um, at the end of the procedure, we also provide a completed QRD form two uh, and where we state any outstanding disagreements if there are any and uh, bookmark PDFs in line with the EMA requirements. So, you can trust us uh, to um, implement the NCA changes accurately and consistently throughout the product information and across the different strengths and presentations um, as necessary. To accurately complete the QRD Form 2 and, if necessary, state any outstanding disagreements in a clear way for the authorities. It is very rare that uh, we have disagreements that are not resolved, and it mostly happens due to the lack of time uh, before the submission deadline. Um, unfortunately, some of the NCAs, they send their feedback past their due date, which gives us very little time to discuss any issues, especially if there is uh, back and forth communications with emails uh, with, uh, with the authorities, it can go, um, uh, it, we might reach the submission deadline uh, without having uh, reached an agreement. Um, but DWL acts uh, quickly and efficiently to avoid leaving issues unresolved. And finally, uh, you can trust DWL's experience in um, regulatory affairs to provide uh, final submission ready packages in line with the EMA requirements and we can also uh, provide it via UDRA link so you can um, forward the package directly to the, um, to the EMA. Um, a package ready for submission includes 25 clean uh, PIs, 25 annotated PIs, which includes um, the English file as well, um, 25 bookmark PDFs, QRD Form 2, and uh, any correspondence uh, that we may have had with the NCAs. Well, I hope you have found this um, webinar useful uh, for your upcoming CPs. Uh, thank you very much for attending and we would welcome any questions if uh, you may have any. And also here, um, our contact details, um, we would be happy to reply to any questions you may have that might be more specific to your submission. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eleni, for the thorough explanation of your services and the translation process. Uh, it was interesting uh, for me also to see the details of the translation in your service. Um, it must have been very clear, but because we have not received any questions. Oh, that's great. So, <laughs> <laughs> so both presentations were, were um, no questions. If there are any questions, feel don't feel, uh, feel free to contact us. No, don't hesitate to contact us later. Um, you have the contact uh, addresses of both. We will share something um, about the recording. So, Eleni, thanks a lot for your presentation thank and you thanks you, for attending. Thank you. And hope to see you soon. Bye yes, bye. Me too. Bye bye. Bye everyone. <laughs>